Okay. Um, that's true. You can seriously upset and check it out. Anyways, um, we can move on if we want. We can move on to a whole new topic. Do we have a different topic we want to work on? What are you guys? You guys are engineering, you said, right? Yeah. What are you specifically engineering? What are you just doing? Uh, that's the kind of thing I'm kind of at the point where I have been doing is getting classes, so I'm trying to figure out what I need to figure what out. What to get you excited? Yeah. I, I was uh, there. I know exactly. I'm still struggling. I think, from I think he's, I, I can't remember his first college. name, but his last name is Tozier. I think he's still over there in engineering. Have you ever run into him? He's a student at Tosher? Okay. He may be graduated by now. He was building a uh, sugar rocket motor. Oh. Well, it, they're not that hard to make. Yeah. No, they're really not because sugar has a lot of energy in it. And with a few other chemicals, you can make a rocket rocket fuel. You don't have to buy his essence in it. Uh -huh. Well, and of course, he's he's working on something a little bit larger than most of the Estes. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and, uh, also, I think you mentioned this one time, or was it you from a couple years ago mentioned this, uh, or somebody else? <laughs> Depending on what you order on the internet, it might get people to come talk to you. That would be me because I yeah. have people to come talk. Yeah. To you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just, just you're yeah. in a college and you're buying this stuff. Oh, this, uh, this is my school. <laughs> just, just what do you need with plutonium? <laughs> but, but you're right. It doesn't even have to be something that much. You know? it, it was only a pound of it, but it raised red flags. And it, what, what was it? It was just a task. Okay, there you go. But it, well, I think what was scariest is it took them 11 months. <laughs> Yes. If you were an imminent threat, they're too late. <laughs> Anyways, um, but no, I understand that until finding that kind of niche to fall into, I'm still kind of trying to figure that out myself or engineering or whatever. My uh, goal, kind of going off the goal thing, for me, it's been easiest. And I'm, I'm not everybody, obviously. Just find a goal, stick with it as best you can, and keep looking at that goal mm -hmm. with uh, kind of sort of things looking up to that, uh, tasks looking up, going up, leading up to that goal. For example, mine is SpaceX by 2016. I want to work at SpaceX. I don't want to work at SpaceX. And it doesn't necessarily have to be SpaceX. It could be a big one. It could be some new SpaceX. I don't care. But SpaceX is the one I'd like to. So that's the goal. We have to have something, not just some new SpaceX. Or, uh, that's not a goal. It's not specific. No, uh, yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Find something. Um, but I used to want to do complete engineering. Designing those nuts and bolts, but then I kind of lost interest with that. Uh, not necessarily, not that I don't think it's cool, because I think that's awesome to do that. But may, I found out, for me at least, I'm more interested in this, it's not funny, but I'm more interested in talking about it than I do. But what I, my point is, I'm interested in the communication aspect of that. And what does that mean? It means I have to actually go learn stuff and know what I'm communicating. So maybe that's you, I don't know. But you just got to find something that you enjoy to do and figure out how to. One of the things that's been nice being a member of the Cosmosphere, for me especially, has been the astronauts that have come through. And I have not to this point ever listened to an astronaut give a speech talking about Apollo that references we're going to go to the moon by the end of the decade. Without adding the other part of Kennedy's speech, and safely return. <laughs> Not a single astronaut I've ever ever heard speak about that has missed and safely returned because that was important to them. That's true. There's plenty of people who would volunteer for a one-way trip, but they weren't there. <laughs> and, uh, and 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 what what that, maybe that's what you need to figure out. What is your safely return? <laughs> <laughs> what would you do and still still be able to come out of it? Uh, uh, what, what, what you know? There's so much in, in engineering. What area are you in? Uh, any, any particular area right now? Yeah, I'm majoring in aerospace. Aerospace. So what caught your interest in aerospace? Uh, it's kind of hard to say. My birthday was July 3rd, so I grew up with rockets pretty much every birthday. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, one way or the other, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, see, have you ever gone down to Argonia for their rocket launches? No. Okay. Yeah, I built quite a few of them. Okay. Uh, LDRS. 
You know what that is? Sounds like large name for Shrocks. Society. That's what I wanted to do. Yeah, uh, yeah. LDR is as large. I understood it was society, though. Lar large, dangerous rocket society. And they, every once in a while, have their convention down there at Argonia. Which is why it's kind of nice to get used to Argonia's launch site in between those times. They do things like, <clears throat> hey, here's a porta potty. Can it fly? <laughs> <laughs> that's why By the way, it does. Not well, but it can fly. <laughs> that's one thing I forgot to mention. Find a community if you like other people. Uh -huh. So maybe you should just, uh, maybe I would encourage you to. That's what I'm really interested in. Find a rocket group to get all mm -hmm. of them. And there's, I think, a couple of good ones. Oh, in oh yeah, there's a rocket club at Wichita State, and there's a number of other things mm -hmm. there, too. And just and to me, you know, like uh, I went down one time to see the Liberty Bell 7. Uh, uh, it wasn't Liberty Bell 7, it was Redstone uh, Mercury uh, launch, uh, six scale. Didn't do too well. Uh, but it was fun watching. Uh, oh, that's almost a smart watch and a successful uh -huh. long Yeah, and uh, they had a, uh, what was it, one of the deltas uh, scale. Now, I usually only go down to Labor Day. They have them more often than that, what they call fun, fun days, where anybody can launch their rockets. Uh, and uh, But on the waiver days, which are Memorial Day weekend and Labor Day weekend, they get an FAA waiver, so the everybody knows uh, that that they can reach air, they can get high enough that bothers commercial aircraft. <laughs> yeah, so so it, it's warning the commercial pilots that hey, there could be stuff that you want to look out for, and and there is a uh, uh, you know a, a commercial airway going through that area. So it, it's not it is important. But there's only a half a dozen or so places that get waiver flights per year. Uh, not because the FAA is that tough. Got to have the people who care enough to go do this stuff. And they have a really strong group down there. And this farmer lets them use their feet. Now on waiver days, you have the stuff that everybody can build a kit for. And you've got the, like the one guy was practicing with his sugar rocket. Uh, he wasn't flying it. He just wanted to see that it wouldn't explode. <laughs> and so it was planted in the ground. As you might guess, it, the exhaust went up because <laughs> it wouldn't do you much good going down. Uh, and uh, but uh, you know, for me, I, I'm never going to build a sugar rocket. But seeing somebody who's gone to all that work and testing their stuff there was fun. The 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 Delta flight. Yeah, it was, tough. huh? Sorry, is it tough to make a sugar rocket? My understanding is no, as long as you're careful. Yeah, you, uh, you mix kitchen materials. Uh huh, you, you mix, mix it up. Mix up the pan, don't, solid fuel. Probably you don't want to use any of the utensils for anything else. <laughs> I would, yeah, I would. Yeah, and I think you have to use a lot of metal utensils. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you melt the sugar and add the chemicals, and then just you cast it into the, the shape of the solid fuel core that you want. You just light it. Uh -huh. and, and, and be careful, don't light it on the side so it's all uh -huh. make sure it's mounted. And, and, <laughs> and, and usually you have to have some kind of nozzle because if you don't constrict the, the uh, exhaust, then uh -huh. you won't get as much thrust. Yeah. So you, you uh, now you can buy nozzles, you know, all pre machined and everything. And, and uh, so you can just you know, do the, get the chemicals, get the sugar, and, and heat it up. and I think you heat up the sugar and then you throw in the chemicals. I, I think there is a prohibition about eating the chemicals and mixing uh, <laughs> because that could be a bad day as well. Uh, but, oh, I think uh, any of uh, the National Rocket Association uh, website, probably, you know, as I remember, has some fairly decent links on recipes and techniques. All around there. You can watch YouTube and watch the game on YouTube. Oh, yeah. I've seen them. Uh, I didn't want to make a similar thing, but I just wanted to tell you that. There used to be, and I, I just, uh, so, you know, I, I wish somebody would make it again. There was a micro hybrid rocket kit where you basically put the oxidizer in a balloon, stuck it on the end of the rocket, and lit it off. You know? And some of the people were using 
rat, you know, cardboard tubes as the fuel. <laughs> and so you could make these tiny little micro engines. You really weren't any good for flying or anything, but just to get a flame out of a little micro tube about like that. You know, and that, again, YouTube. Yeah, exactly. You know, uh, uh huh. Especially something like that. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, Argonia is so great because uh, they let all of that stuff happen. And they have so many feet as the small rockets, and then so many more feet out as the about a, a quarter of a mile away is the next next level, and then a mile away is the really big ones, because that's the safety rules. Yeah. If you're going to launch something this big, it's got to be that far away. It makes it a little tough to see what they're doing, especially if you don't have binoculars with you. <laughs> but uh, we wa we watched them put the Delta together, and it takes off, and of course. Typically, Kansas is such a, a nice environment to fly in, you know, no wind. <laughs> <laughs> this thing takes off and goes sideways. And it's going along like this. Now, they, they were hoping for a waiver flight. They were hoping for tens of thousands of feet. Ah. So going sideways at 100 feet really wasn't what they were shooting for. No the first three, <laughs> three external rockets peel off. The second three come off. That's, that was part of the plan. And then it was time to, and then about, so we started watching like that. And watching, watching. First three come off, second three come off. Separation, the parachute comes up, just, just rips right down the side of the, because it's still thrusting. <laughs> and then everything drops. Oh. And I'm sitting here. Wow, that was so exciting. I, I know that they're disappointed, but this was, this was a great show. And then it hits me. I started looking at there, and it ended over here. If it comes this direction, <laughs> it gives you a whole different perspective on it. So what about the rockets and some of that uh, launches that you like the most? Was it the preparation? Or? Uh, it just the watching it fly. Just watching it fly. Because I used to say, you know, you can get it, you know. Say what I was talking about earlier with Armadillo. You know, they're working with a company that uh, makes the rectangular parachutes that are uh, servo controlled. So you fly the chute, and they flew their booster back to within 100 feet of where they launched. There's another interesting area to be involved in. You know, controlled parachutes. I mean, geez. you got to find a community that will help parachute. Regardless of what it is, even if you don't know what's happening. And, that, that, and that, this is a perfect time to start looking into Absolutely. all those different aspects. And no, if I, you like watching flying rockets, then Argonia is a great place to go meet people and, and get into the community and stuff, and the flock of the rocket clubs and stuff. Just try to meet people. Because uh -huh. yeah, when I started going to Wichita, um, yeah, right when I got out of high school, I'm getting ready to go back there in the next six months or so. But um, when I started going, I, Twitter, I think, was it was out there, but it mm -hmm. wasn't a thing really. It was kind of me going to the walking down the street. It, 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 yeah. <laughs> some of those stereotypes still remain. And most people, Twitter's a thing. People always talk about Twitter. That's right. Um, but before that, I didn't have that community. Now I see I'm part of this Twitter. I actually, really started off with the space community that I watched, the space week camp. Whether you've heard of that or not, I was that was from Virginia Beach. I watched that movie, which is an echo deal. Close, <laughs> um, but it was because of that I found out about something called NASA Star. Uh, at the time, it was a NASA tweet up. Uh, now they're called NASA Social Media. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> because they're involved with all the other social media. But they were called tweet us because they started off on Twitter. And I was like, I heard about it. I was like, oh, I don't really use Twitter, but I have a Twitter account. I guess it was the most thing I have to pay for my travel. I'm probably not going to get it. So everybody's probably going to try to get this. They're going to accept it to 100 people if they don't get a VIP tour of the Jones Space Center. In February of 2010, during the mission of uh, Space Shuttle Endeavor, 
I didn't think I'd make it. But lo and behold, I get this email saying, hey, you've been selected. Yeah. Yay! How can I afford this? It seems to be. <laughs> now what? <laughs> so, I have this epic, it's still not my most epic road trip, but it, uh, an epic road trip where me and my friend Ruben basically, I'm a poor, poor college student. Yeah. Yeah. I think, that, I think they're quite, they're quite <laughs> college poor. Exactly. 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 Um, and I was working. And I was working full time at Pizza Hut. Still. Still. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but I didn't want to take off. It was on a Wednesday. I didn't want to take off any more than I had to, so I took off Wednesday. I worked until 4 p.m. on Tuesday. Drove down to Houston, from Kansas City. Not from Houston, from Kansas City. <laughs> uh, what is it, like 13 hours down to Houston, know. something like that? All night, had a couple cat naps. But got there by registration at 8 o'clock in the morning, or something like that. All day, uh, all kinds of I met all the astronauts. I got to go inside. I got to all three mission control centers, so on and so forth. Oh, wow. uh, got to go to neutral buoyancy lab. Um, and basically, all, you know that place where they do all the training, the rockets and the space mm -hmm. station? Usually people are behind the glass up there. Uh -huh. I was on the floor. Yeah. <laughs> the only thing we couldn't do was go in them. <laughs> all this training stuff. And we got to see the wake up call for the uh, spatial endeavor. Yeah, it was pretty cool to see. Uh, and then we got to see space station mission play. I got to go sit in the control chairs for uh, the old Apollo control. <gasps> yeah. It was probably one of the best, last, you know, like, spur of the moment trips I ever went on. And that night, I drove, we and we drove back all night, 13 hours, and had cat naps. <laughs> and went to work at 2 o'clock the next day on thir uh, Thursday. And I had to work all day. I closed the pizza hut that night. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, long story short, I made it work. I said, you know what? What do you mean I gave you a pineapple pizza and you <laughs> ordered pepperoni? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But the point is, the point I'm getting to is, I didn't know about that community until that event, but I just watched something I enjoyed. And I, that was that event right there that I got into Twitter, started tweeting, found all these people, community, and that just grew from there. And now here I am, we are a space up. You know? Mm -hmm. um, you just don't know. There's a map, you got to find that community. And Twitter and social media is a great way to do it. Social media is a great way, and, and this is kind of a question, but maybe rhetorical because I don't know if there's a ready answer for it. But you know, you you've got these communities online where you have Twitter and all these uh, ways that people like that can get up <coughs> through NASA. What are ways that people can utilize social media to uh, connect on a more regional level? I mean, that's obviously what we're thinking. Yeah, about actually, here. yeah, that's, that's because, what we're that. Because we're only the tip of the iceberg as far as people that are actually interested in space. How do you do that in an area that's not where space isn't an economically um, big deal, like a Houston? That's a really good point because all the space trips per se that I've gone to, because we're honestly, where does space happen? Florida, and now in the New Space Coast, and uh, California. And Texas. And Texas, too. Don't go to Texas. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in the United States, it's the best mm -hmm. overseas. That's like the ball game right there. But here, there's hardly anything. And every single event, even if not when they get NASA to the NASA to the final space launch, I still get for a non NASA to the at Space View Park, which is still the end of the meeting people and all that stuff. It's still the people I still talk to today. Um, and also because of the social media, that's not going to be too much of sex. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, that was NASA like drooling right there. <laughs> well, uh, um, Go ahead. I just, I, my point is, it's not the space needs don't just live on the coasts. Yeah. They're here, and you guys are here. You just got to figure out, like we were saying, how do we get people involved? I guess I'm just getting the question, I guess. Yeah. But how do we get people involved in the multiple area? Because they're there. They just don't know it's you. They just don't know. They yeah, don't, a lot you know, of times, people just don't know you're around. Exactly. They, or they just don't know how interested they are, too. That's, that's something else, too. Well, the. Uh, Constellation in the early days that gave out, you know, how much NASA is built around the university system. One of the uh, Constellation grants was to the uh, School of Mines in, in uh, Colorado. Mm -hmm. I went, what? <laughs> but the regolith uh, uh, is uh, very much like the, the dust in uh, hard rock mining. When you uh, shatter the rocks, 
uh, dust in, in hard rock mining is uh, very uh, sharp. It hasn't had any of the weathering or anything. And that's why they went to the School of Mines because obviously, you know, the, the, water, the use of water in mining is just to keep the dust thing. Because the first big hard rock mining, everybody does it. Not immediately. But they got that rock dust in their lungs and they cut up their lungs and they basically bled to death inside themselves. And it's a big issue for mining. Well, the they're not a single sample return from Apollo came back uncontaminated because all of the seals were destroyed by the, the dust. Wow. Because the dust is so sharp, it broke every, there was not one seal that left. And you talk to the Apollo moonwalkers. And one of the things that's common is the smell of gunpowder in, in the lunar module. I'm going, okay, wait a minute. That, that, that says there was something in the moon dust and stuff that combined with the air to give you that smell. That's, that seems to me to be organics and stuff. But it also comes into play about the seals. If you're going to have a moon base, how do you keep people alive? Because eventually... Your seals are all going to just be destroyed, and you're going to lose your atmosphere, and that's not a good day in the vacuum. Uh, and uh, so they, that the, the money was being spent at the Colorado School of Mines for an electrostatic system to try to keep the dust in, which they thought would have a plot, uh, you know, applications in mining, and that they would already have uh, that, you know, that apparently they've already been working on some of this stuff, and and so that's why they went there. You know, you, you, it's, it's not that far of a leap once you know it, but right off the bat, we're going to go, we're going to have a moon program, so we're going to go to the Colorado School of Mines. You know, that's, at the face of it, it's kind of a big jump, but, uh, you know, that kind of engineering is already being done to try to protect people here on Earth, and that could have, have, apply into the space program. And that, to me, was kind of eye-opening, because as much as I've watched stuff over the years, you know, uh, all of that stuff was all new to me, and uh, now that's, you know, you ne just never know what little bit of something is going to be so important to, to things. Uh, earlier on today, you mentioned 3D printing, mm -hmm. and uh, just uh, like in, in a situation that's like that, in a situation where uh, you're starting a, a moon colony, you're up on uh, the space station, Rapid prototyping, microfabrication technology uh -huh. is critically important for uh, an individuals, any aspect of, of this stuff. And um, just I guess that's why I'm trying to start a uh, makerspace, which is oh, yeah. like a fabrication laboratory or uh, like a rapid prototyping lab. It's cool. So if you want to build a rocket, maybe send the three D uh, diagrams over to you, and you can just spin it right out. <laughs> really make a rocket. <laughs> may only fly in Argonia, but it may be. You know? One of the things when I was at SpaceX, it's not quite clear. Right. One of the things they had there was a simulator rocket, making a machine move all the materials in a way. Minus the engines, obviously. <laughs> It was actually part of this big room, multi-room size machine that I literally was slowly putting it in. It wasn't the right time yet. Yeah, this is pretty, it was pretty crazy. Well, yeah, you, 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 you look at the, how things have changed. You know, we talk about, you know, a lot of us saying about Neil Armstrong and precision engineering, but there was a lot of just sitting with a lathe and controlling them, people manually doing things back in the Apollo days, and, you know, you know, unless you're in your own workshop doing something, it's pretty much all numerically controlled machines now. And uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, all the different, because of the first rapid prototyping unit that I saw was a clear resin fluid uh, and an ultraviolet laser. And the laser hardened the, the resin and they raised the level of the, the resin until they got done with the prototype. And of course, now we got powdered resins, and uh, you know, again, things that you thought you knew. I didn't know there was metal 3D printers until recently. 
and uh, how you know how you know used to be well I guess and originally the problems that SpaceX had trying to get a machine shop to build me ten things when they got a job uh, of five thousand things. Well, we just don't have time for your little little project, you know. And uh, so all of this stuff is is changing. And, you know, rapid prototyping techniques, 3D printing techniques. You know, like I said, they're putting the 3D printer on the space station. Uh, you know, it really looks like uh, that's going to be one of the big game changers in, in colonization, deep space, all of the different stuff is, you know, we don't have to have quite so much redundancy you know, we don't have to have a system that's so fault tolerant, you know, because we can make the parts that something right so we can make it where we're at. Like that's really like true. Uh -huh. And that's one of the things about Inspiration Mars that uh, that even if they never fly, mm -hmm. the, the the changes in medicine that they may be able to bring about. Yeah. You know, yeah. 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 It shows life support in medicine. Mm -hmm. That's right. No, no. I, I, well, to me, that is on topic because, that, well, like they're talking about, yeah, I'll, I'll, you know, let's face it, there's going to be something in there. There's going to be some technique that, no matter how simple they make that system, they're going to want some way to uh, come up with ways of maintaining that system over two years, you know, and not take everything with them. Because, you know, you got this, but you need that. Well, if you just have the materials to make either one of them and make what you need, is a lot better system, yes. Now, are you going to do this as a commercial operation, or are you... Uh, no, a non-profit. Is a non-profit? Uh, I mean, there's... there's uh, there are most of the major ones I've seen that I go on down the road. Uh, I mean, some, some go as kind of educational organizations, which is pretty cool. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's just... Uh, well, pretty much anything that can be made can be, you know, you get to do, you know. The, the biggest problem is uh, getting the file to, to do it with us. You know, you've got to scan something or have the mechanic, you know, the engineering drawings or something to uh, do the, uh, to feed into the machine to oh, do yeah, the stuff. Yeah, yeah, like uh, when I was down in the balance makerspace, they were just posting classes on Open source uh, CAD design programs, which, which you can you can do this stuff. You can, in fact, he was also teaching people how to use uh, um, macro creation um, executables uh -huh. on, your, on your computer to, to, to streamline and speed up the process. <laughs> of, uh, making these CAD files <laughs> from like duplicating processes. And, and okay, so I need a battery door for my remote control, and I can just call you up because <laughs> nobody makes a battery door. Separately for a remote control anymore. <laughs> yep, yeah. and so that's one of the things. And my, my primary job these days is fixing consumer electronics. You know, you break a gear in a VCR, and you're pretty much mm, unless you find somebody with a VCR with something else broken in it, and they want to sell sell you it for to part it out. That's one of the things I keep keep envisioning is that. There are so many mechanical things and so many devices in our homes and stuff that the manufacturing techniques that we have now make no sense to make any extra parts to fix things. But, man, just for one little tab, one little gear, one little something or other, and you can keep something running, and of course, you know, it kind of made, it also has a mindset about a disposable society. Yeah. But there are plenty of people who don't want a disposable society that if they can get whatever, well, let's face it, you know, it, 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 you know a battery door may be 10 cents worth of plastic, but yeah. you might be able to, if, if it's the right battery door, somebody may be willing to pay 10 bucks for it. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, well, okay, step it up a bit. I have a RC car. And uh, my seven-year-old granddaughter decided to see what it would be from here. <laughs> and uh, so now the battery door is smashed, is smashed, and I can't close the battery door anymore. And, of course, tape handles that okay. But, and, of course, 
you know, Radio Shack doesn't sell an extra battery for it. <laughs> You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I could buy a whole nother one, and, and of course the new one probably won't because this is a twenty-year-old car. Uh, a, a new one, you know, but uh, you know that's your option. You know, either tape it together or buy a new one uh, to, to replace. It. And I think there's a lot of things out there that would, would be like that. But, you know, you know, if there's a few things in my life that are that way. I mean, a few things in everybody's life that is that way. There's a lot of few things to be be done <laughs> if you can tap into them, right? Yeah, and that might factor into how they design the environment for a uh, space colony because they want every part to be some modular uh, system that you could make replacement, uh -huh. uh -huh. including the machine itself. Uh -huh. we, we have a Lego colony. <laughs> <laughs> Uh -huh. Well, yeah, there's, and that's it. We're so used to not doing things now because of automation. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I remember when you know, I used to attend like that. Uh huh. I'm very, very old and happy. But, yeah. But it, uh -huh. it, it, it finally flipped, so I'm happy. Right. But, and it wasn't the nicest thing. I was quite no. the chicken I did. <laughs> <laughs> that's how I got you, right? <laughs> 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 that's right. You know, in, in situ uh, resources, yes. Well, what, what was it? One of the plans, one of the NASA plans, which was developed, I think, the Space Society. Uh, uh, well, the uh, uh, creating the fuel. Yeah, it was a market. It was the uh, Because that was one of the things that Armadillo was working on a methane engine for that very reason, because you could create methane out of the Mars atmosphere. Well, at least, at least uh, there, there would be a version that could be, yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, so now, you know, we've, you know, we, we, the technology again, there, it's there. Yeah, there's so many things that can even help terraform. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Well, but of course, you know, Mars may have much more of an atmosphere next year when that comet gets. Well, <laughs> uh, they didn't rule out that it can actually get. Oh, darn. Yeah. I, wanted, I wanted it to at least be six months away from impact before uh, they decided. I know. <laughs> but from what I hear, it's the minimum distance now. It's not zero miles, it's uh, 6,000. Uh, yeah, so. like Which is still, if that happened on Earth, people would be like, oh, crazy, and have suicide probably. <laughs> <laughs> and now we have the close flyby for what? Five spacecraft. <laughs> mm -hmm. We've got opportunity curiosity. Oh yeah, actually, that was yeah, five spacecraft. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, they're already starting to think about orbits, changing orbits. I'm saying this far in advance to them, but they all are still on Mars, and soon we name them. Uh, we haven't named them. Name them. That's the next uh, orbiter that's on Mars this year. This November, I think, right? Does it have a special mission? It's an atmospheric mission. So. They want to see global global cooling instead of global warming. Because <laughs> 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 Mars is cold. Yeah, it's a climate and that's one of the things that is a lot of research going on is whether we can use lasers. To up the data data bits uh, for transmitting. That's what planetary resources said. Uh -huh. Basically, uh, planetary resources is all about using simple parts. Mm -hmm. um, again, back yeah. to the 3D printing, but not only simplifying things so much, really on the 3D printing as so much. But using similar parts, you got this telescope we use to look at the asteroids and down Earth. Why not use that as your collective for laser communications? Yeah, yeah. And dual use. Mm -hmm. you know, and they they just tested some laser communication with one of the satellites on on, on the moon orbit, didn't they? Uh, I think you're referring to a gray mission, but they think they were just communicating that with gravity. No, no, this was uh, within the last month. Uh, 
because what they all they transmitted a photo to the to the satellite using optics on the satellite because it was never meant to do this and then retransmitting it back really crappy picture but but, but that, yeah that wasn't the point the point was we you know it's kind of like you know so many of the repurposed things that they've done over the years that it was just amazing that they that with stuff that wasn't even designed to do any of this stuff that they were able to to do a transmission like that and you know we're getting closer and closer to lasers being our radios yeah. That way you don't have to do exactly the deep space that's just the absolute at that point. Uh, you just have a high power laser that you can send them straight to your space. Uh, 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 and accuracy. Uh-huh. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
having plants and stuff because it was going to be that big of a cylinder, so you'd have a, a whole new colony. And they thought they had all the funding of the big names and everything, too. So I, I liked it. I, I, I always hope that I always have that in the back of my mind on these announcements. Yeah. Yeah. But at the same time, if somebody doesn't try, nothing will get done. Well, an idea like that also kind of came out of the optimism riding on the coattails of the Apollo. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, we were going to Mars in 1980, and we were going to Alpha by the year 2000. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That, that was awesome. Yeah. Alpha That was like the first. Yeah. Well, that, that was what some people were talking about. Well, yeah. 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 Well, the that's like I said, the. I think Bob's in the background of the Mars Society claim to say that we would go to the moon by 19. Saturn by 1980, Saturn by 1980, the opposite side by the year 2000. Yeah. And you call that really the way out. Basically, it's made a point. Yeah. We're moving out. We want to be fine. So, but generally, going back to the uh, generating public interest, and you're right. How do you compare that to the old days? You can be fine. Well, and of course, I, I look at what's happening now, and that happened at, at basically because of Challenger. And Ronald Reagan saying that we need to privatize space and do things. Oh, the satellite. The satellite. Uh -huh. And, uh, uh -huh. Eventually. Uh -huh. and but that's that set set the stage for thinking about things in terms of not the because that's one of the things that I've never found a story before the the space race that had mission control. <laughs> Everything was a self contained rocket trying to survive on their own. Doing something, and uh huh, yeah, and uh, so uh, that was something. That was something people did not envision before we actually did things. Uh huh. It was, it was all planned on. Everything was going to be the, the entrepreneur, the the really rich person who wanted to do something. Well, that's because that's what with the Uh huh. That's and, the way it worked. Uh, and so uh, it was our use. It, it, we, we may look back at the space race as the same the thing that held us back. Absolutely. <laughs> we finally got rid of all of that. <laughs> we got, that was the real one. We got our entrepreneurs working to show us the way. Um, Elon Musk's uh, Jeff Bezos and Jeff Bezos. Mm -hmm. uh, People who have made the money. Made the money they grew up. And actually, you know, maybe Apollo is still essential because you got to think about the inspiration. This is true. They are the use of. That's right. Oh, and then that's kind of where you feel like it's something like an inspiration Mars where you want to where somebody like, that's is private. Right yeah, that's where you have a completely private enterprise that's trying to raise the bar higher. It I think that's all it would take, it's just one of those, whether it's a private man fly to the moon or Mars, it's yeah. just something. Well, look at what Spaceship One did. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, it's it, not, it, it's still, exactly. CNN it's was on the landing strip when they came back. <laughs> that, that is it's kind of such a measure of how the public perspective is different on that. You can't get anybody to watch, you know, back then you could hardly get anybody to watch a shuttle launch, no, or, or launch or landing, but you can have CNN I there for I Spaceship One. Fair, I don't know I saw the live on the news at 4 o'clock hour, on 4 o'clock hour, on a major broadcaster, I was saying this much. Oh, cool. Oh, uh -huh. I was like, whoa. I thought I was going to, because I was looking at the work for NASA TV, and I was like, oh, NASA TV, and I was like, oh, there you go, yeah. yeah. I'm looking for that, because I think it's like a sort of on there. Yeah. But whatever, some people say. It's not, it's, it's, it, it, it's nice background. Yes, thank you. I don't watch NASA TV to watch it, I watch it in the background, I'll leave it up catch something. Uh -huh. So, uh, I think most things do that. Yeah. Anyways, but I was shocked that they were happy. Uh, uh -huh. And I was, of course, they use that, not necessarily for political points for, you know, for people Oh, yeah. But yeah. it wasn't a lot, they were just talking about how they space station. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll speak the name of the one that really ticked me off, and that was Fox News. Uh, because they, they, this has been a lot of years ago, and they were saying, you know, NASA just doesn't do a good job of, uh, of uh, 
start telling everybody what they do. And I'm sitting there thinking how many times that there's been NASA programs that have brought educational material and have been here in the parking lot and in the Cosmosphere and other museums. It's like once every couple of years, there's always something that they're outreaching with and all the different programs like you're talking about, the social programs and everything. I just wanted to reach through and slap that person and say, if you weren't so lazy to turn your head and look, Are you, you would see you all this stuff. stuff. Is it that your job? Show yeah, us. you're a, supposedly a news organization. I know more about it than you do. The like the king of press conferences. Ah. Press conference yeah. everything. That's true. Curiosity found a really funny colored rock. <laughs> breaking news! Breaking news! Orange! <laughs> you said Fox News, though. Fox News also did a good one for the Soviet But like you said, it's a, about a political statement as well. Exactly. Yeah, both sides of it. Yeah, well, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Um, but but I, you know it was just one of those things where I uh, the the CNN lost such a great person with, when O'Brien died. Uh, you know that, uh, he's still alive. He's still alive. Oh, he's still alive. Yeah, he's still alive. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. You think he's dead because he doesn't show up? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> he's not on the on the boot to Bryce things. Miles O'Brien did the host of the uh, Inspiration Mark. Oh, did he? <laughs> well, my, my, my streaming feed was really bad. I caught very little of that. No, no. This was. Oh, yeah. Was, uh, no. Uh, uh, was, there was he still had an agenda, but he right. talked space. <laughs> well, Walter Cronkite was a space geek. Yes. That, well, that was a man. That was a man who. You know, you know, when he tears up on the air oh, over stuff Apollo is doing, <laughs> you, you know you got somebody. <laughs> and say what he wanted about his political meaning. That's right. That he related space. He got. Uh -huh. you know, and, see, and, and you go back to that, and you know, we were watching uh, Compact. Uh, and Sagan was one of those people. Uh, now we have the Grace Tyson who's trying to work his way back the rounds. He's in the. Uh, they got a poster of him in the uh, uh, snack bar. Oh, okay. So one of the one of these kind of things yeah. that's up there. He's on. The we were just talking about it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, the, you know, and Squires. We were talking about Squires' house. Uh, they did a document. I saw a documentary. The thing that would, uh, the, made such a big impression to me about Steve Squires or Stephen uh, Doctor. <laughs> I, he doesn't seem to be one of those people who cares that I'm a doctor, you know. Uh, but uh, they did a documentary on spirit and and, uh, and the opportunity uh, before the, before they were ever ready to launch, uh, and uh, they showed him waiting and waiting to the very last minute on an experiment uh, to test. Uh, I think it was one of the cameras or something. And the, they got delayed, they got delayed, and they got delayed. Spirit and Opportunity were a big deal because that was right off the heels of a massive failure of Mars Bowl. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why we was paying attention. Meters? See, hmm, what should we use? Uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> not tell me. <laughs> I'll use Pete, you use Peter. That's what we'll, we'll solve it that way. And uh, so uh, the. <laughs> sorry. Uh, but Peter, she's bad people. Uh, that's right. <laughs> Chemistry is important. Uh, punctuation too. Punctuation. Uh, uh, the uh, the uh, uh, but the, here here they show him this lonely figure going down this concourse in the air, airport, dragging his luggage behind him on the little wheeled luggage uh, you know thing, and and uh, you know he's got got one of those pulled out handles and the little wheels and everything. He's kind of slumped down because he couldn't stay for the for the test and everything, and the phone rings and they're telling them it was successful, it was successful, and I'm sitting there going, that one, that the documentary person decided to do this and everything after being around the person and knowing things about him, but says one thing, but that his team thought enough about him to do that, to go out of their way to contact him and let him know. It was, it, he, he built a team that respected him and wanted to work for him 
not a task master, master. and I think that, that would have a lot to do with them, whether they're successful or not. Yeah. And when he sits down there and gets so just he, he has such glee when he talks about, <laughs> oh, look, look. <laughs> <laughs> We can't get there. It's too far away. But boy, wouldn't it be great to get there? And then they're there, you know. <laughs> uh -huh. Do you know why they did two of the lambs? I do this. Okay. Uh -huh. They only figured one would survive. Well, the odds. Uh -huh. The odds were so bad. Well, you look at the you look at the odds of black landing on Mars. They're not good. Honestly, our track record for this has been really good. Just landing. Uh -huh. uh -huh. We've only lost one lander. Uh -huh. like, That's right. And that was cool. Because we messed up on the That's right. It may have worked if it weren't for that. That's right. Both, uh, you know, perfect. It's a perfect record. And that was one of the, oh, and, and if, if it hits your fancy, almost all of the data is out there. Uh, the uh, reconnaissance photos and everything of Mars. The a bunch of from the sound of the story, just a bunch of people like us, and, but in Russia, because, right, of course, their perspective was obviously a little different than ours. They went to Mars first. They got a slight burst of static from their lander. Yeah, and, that and is, depending on who you talk to, it was not like what the bird was successful. Right. It was at Mars. And, 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 and again, and, 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 well, it's like Wright Brothers. Wright Brothers didn't fly the first airplane. They flew the first airplane that was able to be controlled. <laughs> and so every every time you talk yeah, every time you talk about these things, it always depends on the parameters that you stick it in. Uh, the Air Force went into space first. If you make space fifty feet up, fifty miles up, Yuri uh, Gagarin uh, went first because he went higher than that and he orbited. You know, Alex Shepard was the first person to land. Spacecraft. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> see. Yeah, so you, you, you can do all of these different things. This, the, the first spacewalk wasn't the Soviets. It was when we actually did, unhooked the umbilical and we, oh gosh, <laughs> but, but yeah, that, that's that, how you can tell the politicians that you things too. <laughs> <laughs> that's when they start making things there. But these enthusiasts think they have found it in the the reconnaissance photos. Really? Yep. Uh huh. Really? Yeah, yeah, really uh huh. I been so busy, I just lost track of space. And, and there are so there's so many things that can be done now because the data is out there. We we, we do rescues now from Google Maps. Uh huh. Um, crowdsourcing not, rescues. Not not Apple, but Google. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We're losing people with Apple. We're <laughs> finding people with Google. <laughs> 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 and, uh, the <laughs> but, oh, uh, man. Uh, some people in the Apple crowd might actually believe some of the things they can do. I guess you could say that. Uh, I probably shouldn't say that. But that <laughs> was just uh, that to me was just so fascinating. One I didn't even remember about that Mars lander, and uh, uh, here they do. Oh, you're oh yeah, that's awesome. exactly. Canada <laughs> <laughs> kind of parachute. Uh huh. Rocket lander candidates. Wow. Do you know no one to find out? I think we ought to go. I thought it's here. No pay, just beat me. That's right. Yeah, I would like to be there. A little bit of oxygen once in a while would be good too. Yeah, I would like to come back. That is a preferable option. Yeah, that's right. Like an option. <laughs> but, you know, uh, so they, nobody, you know, nobody had the will or the time to do this. It's been sitting there, I think they said this is Four-year-old photos or something? Oh, sure, sure. Yeah. Okay, six-year-old yeah. photos. So all this data has been there all that. What else is out there to be discovered? Absolutely. <laughs> oh, images to go through. I mean, that's why they're on the internet uh -huh. for people to figure these things out. You know, that's they, a great example. They have student programs where, like, they'll give students images of Mars and let them make scientific experiments. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Um, I think it's like a class of fourth graders yeah. discover a lava I, tube or something. But, oh, <laughs> <wow>. <laughs> this is a great example. I don't how long ago it was, but it wasn't that long ago. It was within the last six years, I think, anyways. They had an old image from Pathfinder, one person in the 20s, uh -huh. uh -huh. okay? And somebody, later in years down the road, not NASA, somebody else said, look, at my and said, you know what? We talk about all the cure, uh, cure out of them. So spirit signals, that's what it's actually, you guys got messed up, right? <laughs> 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 We didn't know what that was. We thought it was a smudge, but now that we really look at it. Exactly. Exactly. No, but it, it, it 
comes down to you know how passionate are you? Yeah. yeah. And you're you're prototyping the the, the three D printing and how much of a leader are you? Makes me think of this program and, and talking about images and stuff. The there's a lot of the early Apollo stuff you know, before Apollo was flying and everything preparing for Apollo. A lot of those images and everything are on the wrong kind of format for anybody to look at. And so they started this project of what are we going to do? I think it was ten years ago. And they found out that somebody was supposed to throw away the playback machines, which are, you know, uh, you know, the height of the door, the width of that door, and then you go about that depth of the width of the door. That's how big that each one of those machines is. She had them in her closet. That's a closet, garage. Stay closet. Yeah, they closet. Had, had them stuck in, I was thinking closets, closet size uh, yeah, yeah. machines. Had the, I think she had six of them in her garage. I was just thinking about after all these years of finally throwing them away like she was supposed to. When these guys started this project, and she said, Have it. Well, it costs several hundred dollars to refurbish the heads on these things. And of course, the oxides on these tapes are pretty much like sandpaper. So they can only use them for so many hours. But they are now taking those images, digitizing them, cleaning them up, and all of these historic photos, photos of these grainy, blotchy things are coming out in these just exquisite uh, uh, black and white, high contrast photos now. And their big, one of their big drawbacks is how do you keep the equipment running? There's another rapid prototyping, 3D printing thing. But, you know, there, there are so, there's so much data, so much stuff that's out there in the wrong format. I was saying VCR, you know, but there's things earlier than VCR. In fact, this week I found out there is a format called VCR. <laughs> Beta, VHS, VCR was before VHS. They stacked the tape, the reels, on top of each other. And then the tape went across like this, and they stuck it into the machine. Uh, never heard about it until this week. Uh, you know, so there's all, apparently it was a really good format. It's just that VHS was easier to use, and so... It died. Uh, and so there, there's so many formats out there of archival material that, uh, uh, you know, I, I think there's another big business, just figuring out how, way, how to renovate some equipment so we can get that data converted into something else. Yeah. <laughs> I'd just like you to throw out, we're closing out at 3 o'clock. Yeah. We've been kind of on our own for the last two sessions. <laughs> so I was even proposing you know, a 10 minutes break yeah. and then we can start. Yeah. Uh,